On this week's episode of the RAG podcast, I was joined by David Etherington. David is the founder of Saltwater Project, which is a management consultancy and executive uh, search firm um, operating in, well, supporting recruitment businesses with the management consultancy, but working in tech and commercial lines for executive search. Now, the reason I, I had David on the show was not really about his current business. It was more about his career he had growing recruitment businesses in true rag style. Um, now, he wasn't the founder, but he was the number two. He was the guy that was hired to make a founder's vision into reality. He worked for a number of businesses, but what we talked about at length was his time uh, seven years with the NP Group, where he took it from a business that was 25 staff with a 1.8 million NFI to um, circa, I think it was 9 to 10 million NFI and 135 staff, where he took the business through an MBO. He... This 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 episode really resonated for me as as I know there's a lot of owners out there who don't have a number two. They're typically salespeople, visionaries, um, good thinkers, good talkers, but don't necessarily get shit done and don't have that right hand person that can do that. So if you're thinking that's you, this is 100% an episode for you. Equally, you might be someone who works for a recruitment business and thinks you could you still achieve your dreams and goals by staying with the company you work for or joining an existing brand rather than being a founder of a startup? Again, if you're thinking that's you, this is the one for you. It was a great episode. It was a long episode. He's got so much to give. There was definitely not enough time in an hour and 15 minutes to get the the nuggets we need from David, but um, I really enjoyed it and I hope you do too. So without further ado, David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you in. In true rag podcast style, you uh, you got lost on the way in. Yeah, interesting. I followed my uh, Google Maps and it took me uh, into the deep, dark Bethnal. Bethnal Green, Green. housing estate. Yeah, exactly that. You should have seen our old I office. stood out as well to a certain extent. <laughs> I looked like a lost man. I had to stand outside with the dog squeaking <laughs> just so you could hear us. I could hear you as well. Uh, and, uh, yeah. um, but uh, you, you should have saw the last office. If you listen to any of the first season of the rag when we were in Bow, we had an office in Bow, which was about 15 minutes walk from, I don't know if you know the old Ford roundabout off the A12. I know a bit about it. I was born in Forest Gate, so right. I was you know, from well, it's the area. That, well, it literally, you've got a Jusons and a Howdens and a, and a builder's yard and then our office. <laughs> so it was fucking in the middle of nowhere. And that, uh, oh my God, people turn up, they're like, we can't, this cannot be Hoxo. And then it was like, yeah, that's Hoxo. Um, so this is better. This is definitely better. Um, but look, I've given you a little intro, um, but with uh, obviously I can never I can never do it uh, as you could. So can you just from for the listeners' benefit give us a quick overview as to who you are and what you're up to? Yep, um, twenty five years in staffing, and um, eventually got to a point where I've got my own business, which is an advisory and consulting business. I, I talk about it as a management consultancy and mm-hmm. a, and an executive search business because I still do some of that work to keep myself true and uh, feel relevant, but also I've got a really good network in, in, in where I operate. Um, but but running up to that, it's been a bit of a, a story, if you like, amalgamating all the pieces that I felt that were necessary in order to be credible as a as an advisor and a consultant. So post, post the first job, which was seven years, I kind of bumped into a guy that really helped me see that. So the following 15 years were all planned, really, the jobs I took really? and the things I did, yeah, 100%. Wow, how did you originally get into staffing? How did that happen? Um, a mate, isn't it mostly the way? I didn't know that I wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, a mate of mine that uh, I played football with back in the day, and uh, he'd been um, chipping away at me. And uh, and, and actually, um, I had a young family, and um, I was a bit unsure about you know the risk at the time was a bit risk averse because of that I think um, but he managed to sweet talk me into it and uh, I found that I was pretty well suited to all the elements really of being a sales consultant on and I started on both per man contract but mm. contract was my bias yeah okay um, so look I won't go into all of that consultant level stuff this is all about helping recruitment owners grow right and talking about the growth journeys now whilst you own a business now the majority of your career has been as you've said it, uh, as a, as a, as the kind of the number two, yeah, the guy that gets shit done, yeah. which I, I think is an amazing um, place to to talk about and something that a lot of our listeners would benefit from. So, um, where did that start? Let's go back to the start where you where you were moving into that 
senior leadership, COO or MD or supporting the owner role? Where did, where did all that come from? Yeah, out? I think it's interesting because um, if, if we looked at that theme, I could see it even before getting into recruitment. Like right. a, as, a, as a person that could work out, you know, I, I worked in a sports shop, right? And, I, and the guy owned three sports shops. And, and and when I say I worked in a sports shop, it started as a Saturday job mm. back in the day when you used to have them. Um, but then for opportunity-wise, I, I took on a full-time job as manager of the shop in the town I lived in. Yeah. And I just wanted to understand what his plan was. You know, what's working, what's not working for you? And for, you know, working out what his plan was, it's like, okay, bearing in mind at the time, I think it was 19 or something like that. Really? Um, it's like, okay, I now know what I need to do to meet the minimum, but also I've got some ideas. And in the year that I was in that role um, with him, which was definitely a stepping stone, I was trying to work out what I wanted to do. Um, I increased his revenue, you know, it would been, and it had been operating at that level before for some time and engage with a lot of sports clubs, all that stuff. So I've, I think, you know, without going down a rabbit hole with it, I think I've always been in a situation where I've kind of worked out, you know, for somebody, with somebody, what the plan was, you know. And when I came into recruitment, it wasn't long before I was managing quite quite, quite soon into my career. And How long were we talking? So um, a year. Really? Yeah, probably. How old were you when you got into it? About 24, 25, right. about that sort of age. And, um, and, and actually, I was working alongside an MD, this mate I mentioned. Mm. And the business was known as, it became known as Tech Partners International, it sold to Harvey Nash. But um, I, my, my first wife, she lived up in the Northeast and she wanted to move back up there. And I tried to persuade them to open something up there. I'd only been in it for about nine months and they were like, no, we don't think it's, you know, the market's there. But um, I'm like, look, back me, back me. And eventually, after a week or so of, uh, of doing so, um, opened up an office in Newcastle, which then um, we um, took part of the premises in Sunderland and it became the most profitable part of the business. Um, and, and, and that was whilst running a team of people working with me. Recruiting into and, what markets? And recruiting. It's all tech, yeah. tech-backed. Um, I tended to specialise in Microsoft technologies at the time. Um, which has moved on a lot now, so mm. some of it won't mean anything to anyone. But yeah. um, but contract based stuff, I got you know I, I was running seventy five eighty contractors at the time, wow. and you know doing pretty well. And um, you would have been up against was it Nigel Frank up there? And no, not well, not back then. Not back then. No, no, no. They they were a creation from more like four or five years ago. Um, but but you know the ilk wasn't really there at the time. So most of the businesses that were working in the northeast at the time were um london businesses that were you know trying to reach the region so to speak so feet on the ground locally was really good so yeah, i covered that region into how Scotland. long were you there um overall for the business seven years but in the northeast um were about three years before i came down and um was the contract sales director for the uk for tech partners um but with that and to your point really um, again, I was always looking for what's the story, you know, where what, where are we at? What do we need to do? So you're so the sort of guy try- that would tap up the owners and really always want to know what's going on and yeah. and get close to them and try to work it out, yeah. you know, without realising it. Yeah. Um, you know, so that- it wasn't like an agenda; it was just your natural style to do that. There was always an agenda, you know. The agenda was to progress right and Make do well, and you know, probably, and, yeah. and secure secure my work and what I was doing. So I was always mindful of not failing and winning, you know, yeah, yeah. but, um, but I think I've translated that over time has gone on. So if you were to, t- if you were to talk about it in terms of the, the, you know, the moments that, you know, I really worked it out, you know, certainly, um, and, and easily to spot it was, was with MP group, you know, we've worked very well with Chris Cook, you know, as the, as the CEO understood the, you know, his, his thinking around the strategy, um, shared in the building of the strategy and of course then was was responsible for executing So let's it. go into that in a minute in the detail of MP because I think that was a really it's a pivotal role right and it's a, it's a lot people can learn from it just going back to the tech partners was that the place where you left to go to MP? No not at all no So what was um, the journey like? In, in between so this is the point I was saying you know um, I met this guy um, he's pretty well known in recruitment circles from a point of view of um, investing 
um, sorry, uh, angel investor, but also advisor, a guy called Stuart Rogers. Right. Um, and he he was somebody who was looking after sort of um, operational um, effectiveness going through the divestment to Harvey Nash. So he was giving us a bit of coaching. And and I just basically, I've had him as a mentor since, you know, somebody that I could talk to about all the jobs I was looking at. So I went from... Um, Coming back to the, from the States, I went to work for a business called White and then that was a turnaround piece of work um, where I became MD and probably 40 heads, uh, 45 heads. Uh, it had a um, contractors drop off a cliff overnight with the, the way that the market had happened at the time on the telecoms front. And post that, went and worked for a family owned business, which was um, a business called Momentum. And they had another business called Dome, and I acted as sales director for both. And that was in the security and in the um, IT space. That was a short stint, about a year, and um, and then went on to Capita, and I did three years at Capita. That was again chosen. It was uh, a, an internal staffing role then. No, not at all. No, they had external facing businesses as well, and I ran the IT um, external recruitment business which I grew threefold in the three years that, that I was there. I didn't know they had any agency recruiters. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Oh, right. It was very UK-focused at the time. They've, they've started looking outside the UK nowadays as well. But um, that was very purposeful. You know, it was a, 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 a choice of four or five jobs I had at the time. I needed to get some corporate-level experience. So I'd always worked in SMEs, specialists. And I felt that for the purposes of later on in my career, then I needed to be at a point, uh, you know, a corporate to have been successful in or done well in or understood. Um, Do you think, so you took some big roles, you've moved around in a, in a senior capacity. Like, do you think being, the only way you could do that is in a management position? Because if you look at like the billing type, like if you look at a biller's role in recruitment, often it's seen as a negative if you move around seen as a negative if you you know you do a few years here and a few years there it's all about like you know and also when you when you've got such a big book of business and a client base then it, you, you typically can start again and stuff moving around yeah, so yeah. but in a management capacity i always look at it like a football manager like you can go like look at pep guardiola who's i'm a city fan right but you look at the way he's gone from barcelona to he spent a year in new york study and then he went to buy and now he's at city and where it's almost like a project three four years yeah, goes yeah. in turns it around moves on was that the mindset you had? Like, yeah, definitely. I mean, it was definitely a. Um, in each scenario, there was always a, you know, a specific aim, um, whether it be the stated aim from the, the hirer, yeah, or whether it be my underlying aim in terms of experiences I, I wanted to gain, um, turning around a business. You know, as I mentioned, um, I turned it around, bought another business, done my job, moved on to the next thing, um, working for a family-owned business you know i needed to experience that i went and did that you know understood it and then had the opportunity to go and work for a corporate business and the corporate business was again that was more my agenda than it was um this is this the, cap the capital, cap capital right? one yeah because i wanted to experience what, what it was, was like that like in. walking into a corporate as a senior was, what was your it was senior interesting you know you yeah i, I was a, a director um working for who became eventually the uh, co-coo of the business and um, within the workforce um, division, which had a number of companies in it. At that time, there were 51 separate companies within Capita, which I, I ran one. Um, it, was, it was really interesting, you know, the, the move from fluid decision-making, um, you know, uh, more accountability, um, you know, very much focus around what you're trying to achieve as one business, to then being in a situation where you've got a federation of businesses where there are different people's agendas, different drivers, different people trying to climb the ladder in different ways. You know, whilst I've I, I multiplied the turnover and, and the production within that business over that three year period, um, you know, what I knew was what I liked. And, you know, it was time for me to go and do something new at that point in time. So I felt like, you know, I've done, I can prove that I can do that in that environment, but is that the environment I want to work so in? How long were you at Capita for? Three years. Three years, and what, what did you achieve? I multiplied the um, revenues by times three. In um, your department, your yeah, team? Yeah, in my, in my team, yeah. And what did that entail? How do you do that? Um, looking at strategy, client engagement, managing people, got the best out of people. Um, you know, looked at how I could develop those people. You know, had some good quality people working for me. Um, but at the same time, 
you know, being very much engaged as a sales guy too. So leading by example. So rather than being the internal coach and, you know, focusing on what people do from the desk, you know, have a vision for your business and basically be seen to be out there and doing it and, you know, helping people. So enabling is a big deal, you know, making sure that people can see you as someone who can help them get their business done. But at the same time, they don't necessarily see you as someone who um, hides behind their door, right? Yeah. And, and fundamentally, right, every year, 25 years now, I've been in recruitment, I've done deals every year, right? So it's not, and, that, and those deals can range from making placements to winning, winning large client engagements. So for me, it's very much about, you know, not just about saying, but doing at the same time. So um, uh, Capital was a good example of where I was doing that and, you know, that helped towards what, what eventually came about, which is a, you know, a, a three times growth in that business. So you leave Capitan, then you went to MP. No, Asprey Marsden. Right, Asprey Marsden, yeah. Yeah, so I came in as a, an associate partner there, um, initially to look after the banking tech contract and perm piece. But then, you know, the business had been really fighting, you know, it was 2000 and, uh, 2008, and you know what, you know, that, that was recession yeah, period. Yeah. Um, reflecting on, um, you know, that being a wise choice to join a, a banking focused business when the banking market was falling about. Um, I took on a bit of bravado there. I thought I could, you know, um, you know, buck the trend. Um, learned a lot, was doing well there and, um, you know, took on some other departments within my brief, but I could see actually, you know, the business needed, or the people that were working for me, some of the direct reports were very capable. So I made a case actually to the MD, Jonathan Nicholson at the time, that I can bring these guys up to speed to look after themselves, they don't need me. Mm. Um, at that point in time, I'd been approached by Chris, at, uh, Chris Cook, uh, NP Group, and he was talking to me about he needed uh, an enabler. So um, what was NP at the time when you walked in? It had been a bigger business previously. Um, it, Chris had done an awesome job of getting it through that tough time, um, batting down the hatches, you know, so... So what had it been before? It had gone up to somewhere in the region of about four million in net fee income. Right. Um, and been, you know, a, a higher level of heads. than that like 50 staff or something? 60? It had gone up to along those lines, you know, mm -hmm. because they had campaign teams that were delivering and they used, you know, resourcing as a, a model in um, delivery consultants. So they tend yeah. to be large teams. Um, but, but of course, they were the first people to go when, you know, when everything bit. So, you know, Chris had done a good job of protecting the integrity of the vehicle that was the business. So when he came out the other side, of course, he's like, well, so when was this, like 2011, 2012? 2009, I joined in August of 2009. Right. And um, there were 25 heads in total. And it had come off the back of about 1.8, 1.9 net fee income that year. Predominantly UK focused, um, predominantly contingent perm, contingent contract. Yeah. In tech markets. So why why did he need you? He wanted to scale it. And he, he had a story, right? He wanted to go and do something with that business and 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 create an exit, an MBA. So we worked on a plan together in order to do that. We put a five year plan together. And um, you know, ultimately it was my job to to execute it. And so you um, came in as COO. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's a big title for a 25 man recruitment business. It was, but it was a title that we knew we would grow into. You, you kind of had that bigger vision already. And yeah. because you've been a bigger business, it was yeah, easy. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So, what, did, what was the first thing you did? Um, hearts and minds. You know, the business had been through a tough period of time. So, you know, the, the sales guys that were there, they're all good guys. You know, there have been some guys that have been there long term, really loyal to Chris. He had a core set of guys that were capable. Um, but basically it was a case of rather than um, trying to come in and recreate the will, really just learn what's going on, who's got problems, where I can actually help um, and, and be useful. So, you know, that was a, a, a key driver is just getting in and getting amongst the, the challenge that was available there. So, you know, I, and I'd advise that. I mean, I often talk to people about their 90 day plan, you know, you have a strategic, you have a tactical, but never forget the fact that all of that flies only when you've got people on side and getting people on side was a big deal there. So what, so you had, you had a load of people that were loyal. What was there, what was the problems though? What, where, where did you need to 
what do you need to fix? Just, you know, fundamentally, um, client engagements, you know, um, winning business, um, structuring to you know, put the right type of proposals forward to clients, combination really of sales and operational stuff. Um, but, but really somebody that could um, hit the drum tempo-wise to get things going. Um, you know, and, and, and somebody that they could also look at, in addition to Chris, Chris is great, you know, force of nature type guy. Um, but look at Chris in a way that, you know, that he was always that leader and he was, you know, exceptionally good guy at doing his job. Um, but they needed somebody else to look up to that actually still did business, mm. you know, had done business, had done, you know, what they'd done. It wasn't without, you know, all the suspicions and all the things that you'd expect. And I've got some of that from the outset straight, you know, there's a, there's a couple of famous conversations that I've had um, with some of the founding team that, you know, that resulted in really strong friendships after really? a decent period like of time. Like what? Give us an example. He won't mind me saying so because um, we still laugh at it today. But um, one, of, one of the lads who was part of the founding team, a guy called Mark Albra, um, you know, we sat in our, our first meeting with each other. And, um, you know, his, his, his uh, commentary to me was that um, I don't know why we need this role. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know we're, we're, we've really been battling it. You know, it feels like too big a role for the situation, to your point. Yeah, um, I can see where it comes you from. You know, right? so, you know, we've, we've been fighting our situation. We'll, we'll see how good you are, you know. So I sat and, you know, listened to it. And, of course, I, I was empathetic to what they'd been through. You know, we'd, there's a lot of firms that had gone to the wall yeah, during yeah. that same period. So it was a, more of a case, really, of, you know, then let's switch that around and how can I help you? And, yeah, you know, ultimately, we would get into that type of dialogue. And, you know, Mark was always a good biller. You know, he'd be somebody. And, and let's talk anec- anecdotally, but within within, you know, fair range of numbers. But it was always a, you know, 350 biller, that type of level a year, which is a good biller, right? We, yeah, we're so, happy to yeah. take that. Um, but but inadvertently, you know, I supported him. The time I was there, you know, a number of different scenarios, but certainly helped him understand how to um, cross a higher level of production and take him up to, you know, two, three times that level of billings. On and, his own? Yeah. So... What did it look like when you walked in in terms of structure? Because you said 25 people, contract per contingent. About, what was the structure? About, it, was about was two, it was about two thirds um, of sales versus admin or support staff. Yeah. And in that structure, there were two or three teams that were operating and they had some particular um, markets that they might service. So infrastructure and or com, data comms, all that sort of mm. stuff. Um, bearing in mind that the background in the business, NP stood for networking people and it had yeah. been very much focused in that space. Were they contract perm dual desk or was it split? Yeah, mix, mix, mix yeah. So basically there were some who were, you know, didn't want to do perm, they mm. were good at contract. Some that were good at perm, didn't want to do, you know, the other way around. And then there's some that, you know, swore down that the only thing they can do is both. So what did you do in terms of the operating model? How did you, because you've got to build something that's scalable. What was the kind of Yeah, I mean, we, we, we agreed with each other Sorry, we agreed with each other that um, that there would be a threshold in, in terms of heads that we'd look at splitting out, you know, perm from contract, and that actually the key thing was around yield and was around critical mass to get up to a level that we, we could then start worrying about that 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 problem. Um, I am aware, you know, and I do have a purist view of. You can do contracts and contract and contract. You do well and focus on that alone and vice versa. Um, but also having worked in regional scenarios, um, I've also seen that there's a requirement for you to be able to be both to clients. So I've always been kind of um, mindful of circumstantial, you know, mm. what's the circumstances before I start bowling in and making changes. And in this particular instance, you know, there'd been a track record of relationship with clients and that was key, right? You know, ultimately is making sure I understood what a client, what the clients expected from the business and who they expected to get that service from yeah. before I started turning that off from them to be able to access. So, yeah, basically it was a was a dual, de- dual desk until we got to a certain level. So talk us through how it went then. What was the, f- what, what, what did the first year look like? Um, Bearing in mind, it's a little while ago now. So yeah, we're talking... Well, talk this 10, is all about going 10, back 10, in 10, time. 11 years ago now, I guess, um, we're, we're thinking. Um, 
but it it was a it was a main focus really on deep dive for me around what the business was geared towards. Chris was one of the first people that I'd come across in the market who'd really perfected this campaign methodology, um, which we've seen used elsewhere nowadays. But but basically mobilising clients to go to places where the talent was um, holding mass interview days and moving that talent where it was required. And, and actually that stemmed from him having an operation in Los Angeles um, where there was a big gaming um, set up and trying to mobilise talent from outside the region. So taking clients to places like India, for example, yeah, yeah. and holding mass days. Um, but he perfected it locally as well. And so really getting deep dive on that, understanding more about what the product was, what the, I guess that uniqueness around that was that enabled us to be able to drive clients through a process that had high levels of production, but obviously created for the for the recruiting business, higher volume of net fee income for all the stuff you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and basically um, devising... No, you must never forget that in the midst of all this stuff, there's always lanes of tactical stuff going on, as well as you trying to devise strategy yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and enact strategy. So, you know, lots of normal day-to-day stuff when you're managing people, um, which anybody who manages people know, knows is uh, time consumptive. So at the end of that year, what did the business look like? At the end of year one? Um, well, if you look at it from a, um, a growth curve point of view, um, we probably added another seven to eight heads in that year and took it to about 2.4, 2.5 in net fee income. Um, but, you know, again, that's calling on my um, power recollection and I've crossed the big 50 this year. So, it, you uh, know, that's you, not so straightforward. Don't worry, I, I believe you. I believe you. That's all right. What I can tell you is over the uh, over the time frame, um, over that period of time that I was there, we went from, you know, the 1.9 to just short of 10 million in net fee income. And um, and of course, in the midst of all of that stuff went from the um, initial bunch of heads that were there to about 135 heads. Yeah, which um, is significant. Yeah. So let's, let, oh, that's what I want to get into. Like, how did you get there? And it, I don't care if you know the exact date on the exact number, but you, that story that is what we want to know, right? So year one, you've, you've stabilized, got the parts and minds right, and you've started to, you've grown a bit. You've got some extra heads in. You're starting to grow the net fee income. At that point, were you introducing more products and services like this? Not year one. Um, certainly, as we started moving into um, year two, we started looking at you know the next natural progression, and um, you know those next nat- next natural progressions were regional. Right. Um, so we started looking at markets like Southeast Asia, and as a consequence, you know we um, we opened up a business in Singapore, and. And following on from that, um, we then started looking at some other products. So, you know, um, Chris Redman from from Red Holt, you've had on. Um, he he became part of the business, but that was following on from um, us bringing in um, a guy by the name of Mike Jones, right. who who's also been very prevalent um, since in the recruiting space. But Mike had been a client of ours. He was the global head of recruitment for Logica and was really familiar with the campaign methodology. And he saw, um, with having a pretty big budget, I think if I remember rightly, you know, a sort of 35 million spend budget on recruitment, recruitment services um, in the year that he came to us, he met loads of firms who were saying that they're global RPO businesses, but when he really delved into it, no one was global. You know, uh, the language was better than the reality, so to speak. But what he saw is some of the um, the way in which we delivered services. So we had an offshore data mining team in Vietnam that enabled us. And he'd, he'd seen how we'd plugged that into some of the campaigns we were working with and basically came to us. So if you think about it from a point of view of you lay your five-year plan out, but be prepared to vary a little bit. And it was one of those moments, which was we didn't really expect to have an RPO business. In fact, you know, typically we were looking at RPOs either as, you know, being businesses that took our business away or businesses that we were trying to work out how, how we could engage. Yeah. Mike came along and said, actually, I've got an idea I'd like to share with you about how we could create a capability, an RPO capability that we can deliver anywhere. 
and um, and that came about in that um, sort of crossover between the second and third year, and and actually, you know, we found ourselves in situations that we'd never been in before. And was it already a global business? No, no, not really. I mean, we were we were good at doing business anywhere, um, but this just really solidified it because, you know, we took on clients in China and North America, um, you know, in North East South Europe. Um, you know, we we got ourselves um, in in Indonesia. You know, we found ourselves in situations where we'd never experienced before. Um, really testing us. And this is how why, are you winning these businesses? How are you getting access to global audiences? Um, a lot to do with the fact that we were working working with multinationals, and you know, when you're talking with business leaders, which was our game. You know, we always focused on the business leader with the problem. Um, they often bring up, you know, I've got a thorn in my side. I'm looking to build a delivery center in Kuala Lumpur. Um, our recruitment partners can't help us, won't help us. Would you be interested? Um, despite the fact that I'm wise enough not to say yes to everything, um, we certainly said yes to a number of things that we had to scrabble afterwards around to get done. What we're going to do. Yeah. yeah, and we were good at getting things done once we committed. So, you know, we found ourselves doing a lot of that with people that had problems. So, we so it was by... Those. Like you say, yeah. So by going in at the top, that filtered you around the world, really. That then enabled you to navigate through that as opposed to trying to like globally market yourself. It was yeah, I mean, from a, from the outset, like, when you look at it from the outset, of course, you're doing that from a UK location. The more you're doing business in, um, you know, other regions where you've got a footprint, where you're actually at, then of course you've got another pivot point and you find yourself talking to other types of people um, that you wouldn't ordinarily have spoken to when you were just based in the UK. So I think, you know, it's a self-fulfilling um, prophecy in that regard. You, you know, the more you're doing uh, in, in other regions, the more you find opportunity at the same time. So, okay. So did you say his name was Mike? Mike? Mike Jones. Yeah. So him coming in as a client, almost like as a client into the business would have brought a lot of relationships as well, I imagine. Um, and his peer-to-peer network, his, his ability to communicate at that level would have been He's powerful. a strong communicator. Yeah. You know, Mike, Mike's got a particular skill set and, you know, it's not faffing around. He's a very capable guy and he was always really interesting to work with because he wasn't shackled. You know, even though he'd come out of the army mm-hmm. into um, staffing businesses, he found himself on the buy side. You know, done it, done that a couple of times and he was in the in senior roles because of his military um, training and as an officer. You know, he was obviously somebody that gravitated to that kind of seniority. So having him in the business, you know, he was somebody that carried an air of authority, somebody that was not shackled by some of the stuff that happens when you come up as a recruiter through the ranks. You don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, he, yeah. and he would often just, you know, ride roughshod through that and come up with ideas and be like, brilliant, let's pursue that. Yeah, so... How did that progress? Once you open up the RPO business, what, what changed in the organization? Um, well, the RPO business utilized the campaign methodology as part of its delivery mantra. Um, so again, it was almost like a, um, you know, taking what Chris had built early doors and reapplying it in different types of formats. Um, the key thing really was about, you know, looking at ways in which to um, engage with businesses that had divisional or you know not long term problems, which that suited. Um, the the I guess the the key thing that happened were the time the moments when we really flipped into the longer term arrangements. So we ended up going in situations where that had been three month rolling, you know pop up RPO type pieces into three year deals. You know, that was really transformational for us because all of a sudden you're in a situation where you've got a sense of security, if you might call yeah, it, yes, around how you hire against it. Yeah. You start treating those contracts yeah. like individual businesses in their own right. And you then start hiring and focusing on how you can fulfill against it. So I think I think it, it was definitely a mindset associated to the different nature of relationship that you'd have with your client. Um, you are much more engaged with the corporate services parts of your clients mm. on the HR and legal and all that stuff 
than you might have ordinarily been in some of the other aspects of what you were doing. Because, you know, ultimately we were always geared towards making the business leader our friend as a rec- an outright recruiter. Um, but RPO causes you to be, you know, friend to me. And how people. did you keep the two businesses running and how do they work together and cross-sell or support? Um, so we, we always looked at cross-selling and pulling, pulling through, um, you know, the different service lines. Um, at that point in time as well, we started focusing on building an exec search part to our business because we were getting more and more requests to work on senior roles and decided as a result that, you know, we'd incubate that and, and build that out. So we found ourselves in a scenario where, you know, we've got our traditional contingent model on permanent contract specialist businesses, you know, and they were a business business in their, their own right that had its own MD running it which was reflected in um, Singapore. We had an RPO business, but we also had an exec search business. And so in actual fact, what we distinguished quite early on was that the exec search business was almost the gateway to the other. So we did a, you know, a root analysis for all the clients we worked with. Where did the work come from? And of course, we had long-term clients who were part and parcel of that contingent past. But but actually, a lot of the work came from our, um, you know, our... Uh, exec search work and it was designed you know we decided that we would have an integrated service business uh, for a very particular reason we looked at the hierarchy of your relationships you know Chris and I talked about who do you want to speak to every day and and it's the business leaders yeah well business leaders don't talk about contingent recruitment every day they they have you know, mid-level or, or lower-level managers that are responsible for that. So if that's what you do as a service, that's not what you're going to be talking to about every day. And, and notwithstanding the fact that Chris had created some really good relationship with some business leaders and they were loyal to the firm, they were, you know, they were the exception to the norm around that statement. So we said, well, actually, what makes you more strategic? Let's think about the curve of, of I guess, the um, the different business services that you've got. And, and started looking at not just services in their own right, but also from an integration point of view, the different services that you can become sticky in a client and whose agenda that lands on. And, and of course, executive search and RPO, they're right up there. You know, they're on the agenda. They're strategic. Um, two reasons, really. Mostly because, you know, you're looking at um, cost-saving initiatives on yeah, the RPO sure. side. So that's a big um, top table initiative. Similarly, um, exec search at the senior level, whether it's top table or minus one or minus two, causes you to be speaking to those stakeholders every day about what they're looking for. So in actual fact, we ended up in a situation through design that, you know, we were, you know, really choosing the people that we wanted to talk to every it makes day. Makes sense, doesn't it? And then you've got those relationships will filter down into the contingent business. And that's what, and that's, that's where the, you know, the gateway the came value from, really. Comes from, yeah. Which was basically, you know, we'd go in and talk to clients, you know, and we were very skilled at um, delivering services in multi-regions um, for clients, you know, in, in a way that, it, in a way that they felt we got their back, you know, they're, you know, and often the firms that we work with would be, enterprise software firms that have just come off market backed by PE firms everything's breakneck speed change needs to be enacted and they want to know that you can do it and that and that you'll do anything to do it you know and so we found ourselves operating six regions you know simultaneously on projects and you know juggling lots and lots of searches but executing and and of course that gets you into that little club that you then start talking about other stuff. You know, they're interested to talk to you about what other things you can do. So it really created the air of engagement we were looking for. You become much more consultative, much more of an advisory, trusted advisor type level, which I think we all strive to try and achieve. And um, and, and that really became the core of why we did as well as we did at that time. Like it. So how does your role evolve at that point? Because you come in at 25 and you've got now got three service lines. And how many people at that point? Um, well, we're, we're flipping at, you know, um, 60 to 70 before we start, you know, further scale. And how, how's your, how does that evolve? And how, do you, how does your day-to-day change from the days when you, was t- you and the 25 and hearts and minds and well, getting under the bonnet? So now you've got three services. You, you're talking about a much different business. You've got to be on top of everything. You know, Chris relied upon me to know what I needed to know. Um, so finger on the pulse of, of everything that's going on and being able to answer those questions 
and you know that that had definitely been um, bred into me earlier in my career by um, a guy by the name of Andrew Goodman, who's uh, you know pretty well known in that space, and knowing your business is is, is key, and knowing how to answer. Um, topical current questions is really key. So, so being a good number two to Chris was knowing everything I needed to know. Um, client and you know I, I was client escalation, so you know had a responsibility for any you know my phone wasn't going off because people were calling me to tell me you know that you know they've had a good day and now are you. It was often problems that you'd been you know and, and expected to handle you yeah. know. So. You know, there were there were those things, and of course, making sure that I was keeping the cadence of all the sort of delivery up. So, you know, there was a, a mixture of managing the MDs, um, keeping them motivated, coaching them, developing them. Um, Chris Redman became one of those guys, yeah. you know, as part of that process, um, and 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 just making sure that you're the the tempo of the business as best you can be, really. Um, I always used to joke with the guys, you know, it'd be, be like, just ask Dave.com because uh, people would come to you all the time just asking any question. It was like, you know, like being a search engine. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, you, you became used to either knowing it or going away and helping them uh, get the Find answer. It, yeah. yeah, so I found myself very much, you know, always on as a, as a COO. Um, it, it was slightly different because you've got more people to contend with. Was the business cash rich when you came in? Was it? Was it? Did you already have the stability to to make those highs, or did, was it, was there an element of risk in the early days to to propel? Where it you was were? a healthy business. Um, you know, it wasn't on its knees or anything like that no. at all. It had a um, an angel investor that had put money in from the outset, but was always there to support if there was any need to support it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't his line of business. He, you know, he he, he was a um, a property guy. Um, commercial and residential big business you know the families are um, a well-known family in that space and 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 that you know fundamentally it was there with a view to okay we've got through the the tough period you know he wants to support Chris in terms of kicking it on and doing something with it let's 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 grow it and let's execute okay so you're at the 60 70 man mark now you've got those three business units going and as we said it's going to start filtering down a lot of this work to the contingent business. How did the next phase grow? It was doubling down, you know, growing the business units. Um, I mean, at one point in time, um, and, you know, it's always about trying to find the right lieutenants in your business and, you know, the stuff that comes with it. Um, but at one point in time, I was not only the MD, sorry, I wasn't only the COO managing the other MDs, but I was also the MD of the exec search business. So, you know, you're dealing with your horizontal responsibilities um, as well as making sure you're growing a business unit and yeah. managing the people on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, That's how I feel now. So I'm still CEO of the business, of the group, but I'm, and we've got the, 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 the delivery of what we do. We've got the customer success side, which is all about supporting the, the sales side of, for our clients. But then the sales and marketing for our brand, it still falls on me as the, MD, if you like, yeah. of that area. Um, so I can, it's a lot smaller what we're in, but I can see the, you're playing those multiple hats. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, this isn't about my business today, but I have a portfolio where I've got a number of advisory clients and I've got, um, you know, consulting projects and I've got search work as well, I do. And, you know, people that I talk to, like, how do you manage all those things? I'm like, well, actually, I feel like I was... Before the only difference is, I'm not going to that office where there's loads of people that keep asking me, Dave, you know, what's the, mm. you know, how do I do this or whatever the scenario is? I don't have the the day to day people management issue associated with it. I'm as busy as I was, um, you know, and I look at it mentally, I'm looking at it, you know, forget the brand names. They're just all, they've all got something they're trying to achieve. We've agreed an objective, I'm helping them. And and I feel like I'm doing the same. You know, I'm coaching 15 people at the same time. It's a it's an, a number of things that I'm doing today. I feel like that the same as. Do you think recruitment you know, teaches you how to deal with that? Because I feel like the same. Like on any given day, I could have so many different tasks covering so many different areas, and I don't know. I just feel like I find some clarity in the chaos that. I, I, do. I think recruitment taught. I don't know why. I think recruitment taught me that as being a contract recruiter with loads of jobs on, trying to do all this stuff, trying to build teams, hire people. Support deal with your management teams I don't know I just kind of got comfortable in that in that environment which yeah it's an interesting thing I mean you you know 
when when I thought about it, I mean, I went through a period of time where I fell out of love. You know, it was at the back end of um, White and Nun, the the post Tech Partners yeah. gig. You know, went through that whole process of um, people asking you what you do. You know, it doesn't matter how you dress it up, you end up at in recruitment. Yeah, yeah. And you know, oh, you know, that yeah, they always of, give you that look, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. And and I got I got fed up with it. You know, it's kind of like you know, why not take it seriously? You know. Uh, you know, I'm running a business. I've just turned it around. You know, it's a PLC. I'm, a, you know, I've done something. I, f- I fell out of love with it, and I, I actually thought I might want to transition into doing something else outside. And I went through a period of time, uh, probably three months, of starting to talk to and interview with some HR outsourcing. You know, that kind of, still in the same genre, but more professional in, in terms of the way people look at them. Yeah, doesn't really matter. Does I it? met with some people, and I was like, Do you know what? They're not a patch on some of the people that I meet in, yeah. in what I do. And, and when I came back and I and I really reflected on it, I, I reflected on what I'd experienced to date, right? And I'd, and I'd looked at it and I was 31, 32, and, you know, got into the game at 25. Um, hadn't chosen to. Been in these other jobs, you know, like sports shop stuff and the rest of it, where my parameters were just so small in comparison. You know, I was in a town. It was, you know, my mm. mates and all that stuff, you know. And all of a sudden, here I am, all this time on. Um, you know, I'd lived and worked in the States. You know, I'd done all this stuff. You know, I'm running a business now. I'd never imagined I could have done all of those things. So I think, I think, you know, what I looked at was the the running and being involved in leadership and in the recruiting business and being in recruitment in general causes you to be on your feet and thinking all the time and being exposed to you know new things all the time, pushing the envelope all the time. And so I look back and I talk to my boy about it. You know, he's only like, he's only little, he's, you know, seven years old, but, you know, I talk to him about the fact that never imagine you can't do something because actually, you know, that, that had been my, my village mindset. You know, I, I grew up in a village and, you know. No, I, 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 look, I was almost identical to that in a way. I was a teacher. I went from Manchester to Sheffield, went to uni, became a teacher. I did some sales in between uni and, and teaching, which actually... It was knocking on doors and it was awful, but it allowed me to dream of it and it was commission based. And yeah. anyway, I went in to be a P teacher for a couple of years and I loved it at 21, 22. I was, I was on the field in the sunshine, kicking a ball about, but I went to Australia traveling and got into recruitment because what else was I going to do out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my, my biggest, the big, I did nearly two years there, did quite well, came back to the UK in 2012. And that was my biggest, that was that moment for me where I was like, I used to tell people in Australia, that I was, if I met a girl in a club, I'd say I was a teacher that worked in recruitment <laughs> because my qualifications weren't valid. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, so I'd never, com- I'd never actually committed to being a recruiter in my brain, in my heart. I was like, I'm, I'm doing this because I live here. Anyway, I come to the UK, back to, I moved to London and getting a job in recruitment was a hell of a lot easier than getting a job in teaching and PE teaching, which is the most competitive yeah. role you could have. I, mm-hmm. I might have had to move to like the tip of Scotland or Wales or whatever. Whereas I wanted to live in London. I wanted to live in Clapham with my mates and stuff. So I got a job in recruitment. And then after about four weeks in London, when I realized it was fucking hard, I was in a small startup, exposed. I was at Randstad in Melbourne with 300 people on the floor. I was in this six-man office, seven-man office, like fucking get on the phone. And I was like, I could be a teacher again. So I rang one of my old colleagues. I remember looking out the window. It was, it was when the Olympics was ending in, in 2012. So September time, it was, I think they were doing the parade. The weather was beautiful. And I was like, I could be outside with the football now. I saw all I could think was I could be out and and because I was back in England I, I could teach again, so I was like I rang one of my old colleagues up. I told him how I felt. I love the guy. I still got time for him now. I, he's probably not listening. I'm sure he doesn't even know I've got a fucking podcast. But uh, and he told I went. Well, what, what's going on? Anyway, we're talking about three years later, and he just reeled off the same shit we were talking about three years ago. Like it didn't change. It was like Groundhog Day. The only difference that would change was the teachers and and the kids' names. And I'm not slagging off teachers because I know it's a great career for a lot of people. But for me, it was it was a limiting career. It was a like, village mindset. It was, it was a tiny bubble. And after that day, my mate came down from Manchester who'd been in recruitment, who owns an agency now. And he was at the peak of his billings and he was like, you know, he had like nice clothes. He was going away and he'd save money. And so I went from having that conversation to spending time with a guy that was my future self. And after that day, my whole career changed. Yeah, yeah. I came yeah. in the Monday and I fucking killed it. And it, yeah, yeah. I think there's a massive... There's, it's huge that it's a flip point it. I mean I'd already I think you know going back to that earlier point I made I'd, I'd already planned for what I was going to do 15 years hence at the end of Tech Partners yeah 
and then had this kind of moment really where I felt that you know the profession and, and me wasn't being taken seriously by people I talked to but once I did that thing I came back to it and I was like you know I had this moment of re-energization I was like what am I thinking? You know, all the things that I've now experienced, you know, the, all, the, all the travel, all the stuff that I've done, you know, the things I'm doing today, I've never have imagined no. I would be doing 10 years previously, right? And again, take it on another 10 years, like, it, you know, it got even more mad and, you know, the, the NP business was, I love fast growth. I love high growth, you know, um, type mentality. And it was one of those. And you, you're faced with these things every day, you know. How can you... And it was that art of the possible. Can you do something? You know, are you prepared to say no to it? Can you, know, can you back yourself to do it? And we said no to things, but we said yes, yes to, to more, more things. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and, and actually, you know, it was good to have some good people around. And I think that was the, you know, uh, the likes of Chris Redman was a good example. And he's not the only one. And Mike as well before him and, and others we had a really good team of people that, you know, could get things done and they were, they weren't necessarily shackled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing business in the places that we were doing it, standing up teams to deliver services to clients in a week, you know, where we didn't have a footprint, you know, all the things that you kind of, you know, delivering a, you know, a build, operate, transfer um, for a client on, on building a service centre of 270 heads in a year, we'd never done before we did it. You know, it was all those things that you... You know, you say, well, actually, when you really break it down into and when you how, say how we, hard can it be? Was that you involved in all of those decisions or was it you working and empowering people to, to step and you, you making them believe it was possible? Listen, you know, it's, it, there's no way you'd get me saying it was me. Yeah. Um, I was involved, intrinsically involved in all that stuff. You know, whether I led it or whether I advised or whether I supported, I, was, I had to be involved because I was responsible for the you know, yep. the bid, the sales pipeline. Yep. And so, you know, that stuff came under my nose and, and we'd get involved in it and we'd make decisions about whether or not we wanted to get involved in it. Um, but some of that stuff I won, some of that stuff Chris won, you know, when we used to break it down, we'd look every year about how involved we were in securing work and, and, and what is it that we'd done. And, you know, we both played an important part on generating client business and bringing, you know, business to the to the, the table for the guys, which I think fundamentally, you know, that enabled a continuation, always a continuation of, you know, respect. You can't, you yeah. know, you can't lead um, necessarily less. People really see and can, you know, understand that you're engaging with, you know, the, the market today, not, not the market 10 years ago. Yeah, that makes sense. So how did your relationship with Chris evolve over the four or five years? Well, it was interesting. Um, I knew Chris long time beforehand because he'd been, and he is, um, you know, really good friends with the, the first chief executive that I'd worked with and uh, Paul Beek, uh, who's been a serial entrepreneur in the space okay. and done very well. He had um, a post tech partner, he had James Harvard and he's got the, um, what was known as, as the earth stream businesses now, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the you know, all the streams. Um, but, um, but yeah, basically Chris was good mates with him. So actually the tech partners lot, used to play football against the NP group or networking people yeah. at uh, Arsenal where, you know, Chris had an affinity to the Arsenal um, players and, and team through, uh, through his, through his uh, family. So, so, so there's um, a lot of history there. We knew each other yeah. and it kind of became a, Andrew Goodman pops up again because I'd, I'd had him as I personally, not personally, but Chris, uh, sorry, Paul Beak had appointed him as chairman at, at Tech Partners. Um, I'd, I'd, was asked about who I might want as chairman at um, White and None and he'd come in to do chairman work there. And um, Chris had him as chairman at uh, MP Group. So Andrew had actually suggested to Chris, even though Chris knew me, yeah. you should think about Dave. So, you know, came in and, and you know, we we're, we are, um, but we built really, we're really good friends. We, we got on a even playing with each other really quickly. So how was the, what I'm saying is like, how did you split what each of you did? Like, so again, I'm thinking about the, the, the mindset of the listener now. There'll be a lot of recruiters out there that are, that are falling into one or two camps, or sorry, recruitment owners that they might feel more like you, but they haven't got the Chris or vice versa. They're more like Chris. Yeah. I think there'll be more like Chris that are going, yeah, I've got vision and I've got this business off the ground, but I don't really, I don't think I'm the right person to necessarily like 
build this business and work with the teams and the people. Like, I've had people like Mark Sumner on my podcast who said he got to a point and he was like, I'm fucking shit with people. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, I'm better in front of customers. So he got in um, Kyle, Carl, Kyle, um, who, who, Callum, sorry, who, who managed it. Um, and that, that took his business on. Um, wh- 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 how did you two manage that? So Chris was a, is an exceptional businessman. You know, from a point of view of the the way in which he runs his business, and yeah, he is a um, you know type of guy that people look up to. Um, he's exceptional sales guy as well. Um, client relationships really strong. You know, was always very good. He's still very good at handling senior stakeholders, top level stakeholders in firms, and. You know, ultimately, what he wanted was someone to look after the rest, Mm. you know. So, you know, he was kind of, look, I don't want to manage the people, you know. I want someone else to manage the people. And I want someone to get, you know, to be accountable, you know, for the numbers. And I want somebody to, um, you know, to report to me that I can put on the, you know, put put the, um, you know, under under pressure, you know. So I took the, the remit of being the guy that, if you, if you think about it from taking vision, so Chris had a vision, but he needed someone to develop that vision with him. So that's not to say his vision was wrong. It just was, it needed to be shared. It needed to be developed. Yeah. So, but he wanted someone to take that vision and enact it. And So would he, he so would you be managing the sales teams, but he would still be involved in sales as well? Yeah, absolutely. How so, is that split? Or how do you manage that? Just because, you know, if you think about hierarchical relationships within business, you and you're looking within your own business. So I mentioned earlier on about being strategic, but you know, if you look at your own business, um, you'll have you'll have an owner or a leader and you'll have various levels within your no matter what people might say about flat structures, there's always Absolutely. leveling yeah. within your business. So, you know, there's always a need for there to be a level of ambassadorial, you know, senior to senior type yeah. selling going on. And, and of course, a guy that's running a desk, a specialist, you know, who's being driven to be a, you know, um, a Java, yeah, you know, recruiter yeah. or whatever it might be, has got no need to talk to that person up there. Um, vice versa, that person's got no need to talk to the Java recruiter, right? So, you know, unless what the Java recruiter is doing is going to change their world and their business. So you know, what Chris would be doing, he'd be talking to the business leaders on the client side and developing opportunities and trying to find ways in which to, you know, to, to engage the yeah, MP group yeah, business. Yeah, I get it. I Similarly, get it. I would be doing the same thing, um, but I'd also be, you know, managing. So Chris had a, um, you know, if you like, looking at the business separately and having those ambassadorial relationships and, you know, obviously he was custodian to the brand as a, as a whole. Um, my remit was to make sure all that worked and that we were doing what we were meant to be doing and clients were getting what they were buying from us and that that gave us the repeatable business and all that stuff that came with it. So, you know, I, I would see that as very much the, the kind of operating partner. Okay. And then I'm thinking about um, time. We've, we're flying here. It's going fast. But you must be having fun. We were having great fun. Yeah. Having great yeah. Fun. But tell us about this MBO then. So I ended up, see, you had a five-year vision. Yeah, and at what point did it start to come to fruition? And you started. Well, you know, we we f- we basically, you know, every year we were hitting our numbers. We were tracking against what yeah. we were meant to be, which must be fucking exciting. It it's was a super good exciting. I mean, we we I mean, joke. To, to, I'll answer your question in a moment, but to to one side, you know, we did every now and again, Chris and I, you know, take the time to sit with each other and look back at what we did. Yeah, you know. And, and, it, and that's within that time frame. Chaos, you know, yeah. The first time we won 10 retainers in one go or, you know, the first time we won, the, you know, the big RPO deal. Or the first, all those things, when you look back, you think, crikey, you know, we did those things. You know, we, 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 we did a lot. Um, but, you know, we, we knew that we were working towards that. It was always a goal that we were trying to get somewhere. So, you know, it's not a case. It, 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 was, it was an element of, you know, controlled growth in mm-hmm. a way but in, in in a way that was fast and pacey and you know you you found yourself you know lots of locations doing lots of things and you felt like it was in a way um moving you left right and center but it was always to the blueprint so um you know we we obviously 
um, when we got to the point, you know, our goal was to be in a situation where we'd gone north of 1.5 million in Ari, but Darren, you know, we knew that we were moving towards where we wanted to be in terms of getting to a, a potential transaction. We didn't know what it would look like. We had an idea of what it might look like. Um, you know, we, we were looking at trade. We were looking at PE. You know, we we had a feel for the type of situation that we might want to get into. We didn't know where we'd end up. Um, you know, where it, where it transpired in the end was that the guy that was the initial investor um, saw us pulling this thing together, saw how it had been um, really professionalised, let's call it, you know, in terms of the way we'd built the IM and the way we'd structured the business and the way it was operating. And fell in love with it yeah, you know bet, it was yeah. like actually um sorry to have messed you around and we, we had two offers on the table from a vct firm and a, and a pe firm but it's like i'm sorry to have taken you through that whole cycle of the go-to market which you know if anyone's ever been through that process while you're also managing business as usual it's you know really demanding i bet yeah but i'd like to i'd like to put the money in i'd like to you know but i want to bring a co-investor in so we ended up with the same guy Right, which was um, brilliant on one hand because you know you you don't know people necessarily, mm. no investors. So having the same guy that you knew really well, that, we, that was supportive of you, was great to have. But um, yeah, and 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 f- for the fact that you brought in a guy as well that had co-invested on some other things with him, we also got the upside of um, you know somebody with a different perspective, but who was a friendly yeah. in that process. Um, in addition to which, the team from Deloitte, um, Katie in particular, um, stayed in as an advisor. So she would attend board meetings as well. So, you know, you had that mix of people that I think, you know, again, um, we didn't imagine it. You couldn't have said it five years hence. What did that mean for you and Chris? Well, you know, we crystallized some money and we rolled some money forward. And, um, you know, we looked at the next phase, really. And so... So you all stayed in for a period? Yeah, for a period. I mean, I, 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 you know, in parallel, I had other things going on. So, you know, took a call, um, you know, 2015, I think, um, from recollection now. Um, but took a call that it was time for me to... Um, I'd put so much energy into what had happened that I felt like it was appropriate for me to share some time with my family. Mm. And um, and that caused for us to take our family, which we were based in Kent at the time and predominantly in London. You know, my wife was working and and also then not working and then working based on the fact we had a family. Yeah. And um, and we said actually we want to switch up the pace a little bit and you know we want to see how a bit of a different. My my wife had been schooled in Suffolk with her father being in the army and she the school that she'd gone to, which was a boarding school. Had be, and, a, and a girls' boarding school had become a co-ed and you could have day students. So we, we decided that we'd have a bit of a legacy and we moved to Suffolk. And um, at the same time, I was living in... So I we moved to Suffolk and my kids would be going to this school. And we moved there for the purposes of kind of that better balance. But I was living in London three nights a week and, you know, basically trying to balance all of that stuff up. So it was a gradual change, um, but eventually came out of the business with a view to doing what I'd been planning to do for 15 years. So, you know, that was always the goal. And, you know, in the midst of all of that stuff, you know, Chris was best man at my wedding. He's godfather to my son. That's amazing. You know, so we we didn't just have a work relationship in that sense. And what happened to Chris? Is he still involved? Yeah, he's uh, chief executive of the business today. Still? Yeah, absolutely. Did Um, they replace you with another um, man? Yeah, they've they've had a a couple of guys do that that job. Um, You know, I couldn't speak for Chris because, you know, he's he's his own man. Um, we had a really good chemistry. It worked. The, the chemistry was something that, uh, you know, wasn't something that we just felt. Other people felt it as well. And that's not just the staff, but, you know, people externally as well. So, you know, it's always, you know, I, I, I left with good grace. You know, ultimately, I wished the business well and I wanted them to do well. Um, but at the same time, you know, I know it's hard to replace things that work well. You know, so Chris will tell you how well that's gone or otherwise, I, you know, I don't so- bother him for that too much. Before we go into where you are now, and we'll talk about that briefly, what, what I guess, I'm thinking about two types of people that could be listening. One is a recruitment owner who hasn't got a number two. 
right? They're a singular owner, they're independent, they're growing a business, they've got all the, they're doing all of it, but they're probably more of a Chris. At what point should they start to think, you know what, it's worth putting some, some time and effort and cash aside to, to hire someone that can take this business to an, another level as opposed to me just trying to manage people when it's not really what I want to do or I'm the best at. Yeah. Um, things are never linear. So I'm not going to give you an ambiguous answer no. um, because many people set up with somebody that they've already got yeah, in yeah. mind for that. Um, but if you find yourself in a situation where you are that person driving your business and you know, you're, you're, you you're haven't got somebody who's a wingman, so to mm. speak, or a wingwoman, um, then I'd always be looking to try and get somebody in by the time you're, you know, getting to double digits in terms of people in the business. Um, looking across most of the business, particularly in the SME space, most of the businesses that do really well, I've got an executioner or a, Would you look at the people internally and bring them up or would you go out and find someone who's already been that person? You've always got to try and, um, you know, bring people into your business who have got that potential for absolute certain. You don't know what you've got until you really test people in that regard and people will come through, you know, accordingly. Um, you know, and I, I see lots of businesses do the grow, go, grow their own approach to building their businesses. It's a really um, important way to scale. Um, but at the same time, I've seen people bring capability in as well. And, and actually, one of the things that I've found by having... Um, worked at a number of different businesses and not necessarily coming up through the ranks of one firm, you know, and, and we, we see lots of people that have come through the ranks and are excellent at what they do and have got loads of experience within that brand and with with the market they operate in. But operating in multi-brand does give you a view on how things are done. And I think that that can really add value in terms of the way that people see things. So... I would never say don't because I think, you know, you've got to look at what you need in your business at that point in time. So, so you know, it's hard to scale your business if you're doing it on your own. Have somebody in your business that you feel like has got your back, gets you, um, understands what you're trying to achieve, can be accountable, you know, and somebody that other people warm to. You need the staff to be somebody that's going to They don't need to be the biggest that. pillar either, do they? Not in the slightest, no. no. Um, you know, you can often you can often see that some of the most influential characters in a business um, have got nothing to do with the level of billions that they've got. They just see the bigger picture better. They, you know, some people will understand, you know, culture's massive. If you look at, you know, really getting it right around the value drivers in a firm, you know, culture's one of the big, you know, one of the big headings along with strategy and, and mm. operations. Um Culturally, if you get it right, the way that you all behave together, the way you do things, the you know the way that you know you're expected to be every day, and the way in which people perceive you and how you are felt by people, um, you know you can you can go about you know um, building people and and seeing people come through and whether they're not capable of handling some of those things. But yeah. you know, ultimately, some people are just you know oh, there's that nurture nature thing. Yeah, I, I always it. felt like, and gen genuinely, you know, I always felt like I could manage and lead. Um, I'd do it in sport, you know, done it in sport, rugby, football, so, you know, I've always been the guy that wanted to do that stuff or, you know, felt like that was mm -hmm. something that, you know, whether whether I was the best at playing was a diff different matter, mm -hmm. um, but I could galvanise people and do stuff. So, you know, if I think back through all that stuff, different jobs I've had, you know, inside, outside recruitment, mm -hmm. um, I've always been minded towards that. I was a dad young yeah, and so you you end up being galvanised towards responsibility and of course, yeah. you know that stuff. So I think some people are suited to it, um, and it just comes down to you know we do loads of work with our clients, advising them on how to get the right mix in their businesses. Um, any recruitment business leader today looking at you know small business, micro to small, um, small to medium, should be thinking about the you know the chemistry and the blend of people that are in managerial positions and how they fit you know, in the business. Together. So definitely look at it. Definitely think about it from a point of view of, you know, not not restricting yourself in terms of your ability to continue to be creative and lead because you'll get bogged down otherwise, and, you know, in the weeds. So that leads us nicely onto where you are now, the salt water project. Is that right? If you say it in one word, salt water, which is... Which is Sorry, I just yeah. made it sound... It's a lot worse. The salt water project. So, so the salt water project limited is the company, yeah. the official company name I trade is salt water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what, what's it all about? 
It's a management consulting business and a, an exec search business. Um, you know, the, uh, the the play on the brand is, um, per, on the personal side, it was to do with my move to Suffolk with the family. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw that as a project, as a, you know, let's re-energize what we're doing and how mm-hmm. we're focusing and we were by the seaside and I kind of felt that affinity to yeah, yeah. all that stuff. So I was like, you know, I've, I've got this feeling about saltwater. Um, and similarly, you know, from a point of view of the, the business side of things, um, it's about buoyancy and cleansing, all that stuff, so helping people. Um, so the business was designed to be something, you know, that was something, you know, business personal is one of my hashtags. I like to do a fair bit. And um, and I feel like it's got both angles from, from a point of view of a brand. Okay. And is it recruitment businesses you predominantly work with? Um, mixture, uh, predominantly, yes. So on the advisory and the consulting side, um, 85, 90% of the businesses I work with are recruiting firms. But when it comes to headhunting, you... Business consulting, technology sector, primarily. Um, I dabbled at, when I first set up, um, as you do, because you don't quite know sometimes how cards are going to be dealt. But I dabbled with a few um, senior placements in the recruitment space and, um, you know, felt very quickly what what I knew really in my gut. It's not what I wanted to do yeah. in that. It wasn't that I set out to do it, just because of some advisory or some mm. support work I was doing, I got asked to do some stuff. MD higher uh, type level um i made some good hires for the clients but i didn't enjoy the experience and i felt compromised mm. so i stopped that piece so i focused the okay the exact and that's based on all the relationships you've built and like predominantly it. yeah i always said that i would um maintain you know the network i'd built and you know use that i've got clients who like to work with me and they really like working with somebody senior that basically gets it from a you know their challenges perspective so keeps your finger on the pulse in recruitment as well it allows yeah. you to stay close to the when you are advising a recruitment company you've still got the ability to say well look i'm still doing it so i do you know i do do that i mean some people you know take it or leave it don't they um i still talk to the you know the billers in the businesses today um you know talking about average deals or talking about what they did last year or other stuff and still be in a position to say, well, I'm doing that as well. And, you know, I'm doing this mm. other stuff. You know, it, it makes me feel, you know, credible. And, yeah, you know, yeah. aside from the, the business experience and, and it helps me understand some of the challenges and also opportunities that they're faced with, right? So look, David, I'm, I'm, we're out of time. It's one of the longest episodes we've had and I've loved it. It's, you just, you've got one of them voices. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> so look, <laughs> I think you've got so much value. We've, we're never going to be able to get it all out of your head in an hour and 10 minutes. But um, I'm hoping people will reach out to you as a, after this and think, this, there's a couple of reasons. Again, are you sat there in a recruitment business as an owner thinking, I really need some help to even think about the kind of dynamics of what I need? You're the guy they could talk to about it, I imagine, right? Um, but also, would you, would you be open for people to just reach out and ask you questions? Like, yeah, I'm always I'm always open. Listen, that you know, we've, we're in an era right now, probably... Um, more than I've ever seen, where there's a exceptional amount of support available in the market. Recruitment clubs, you know, where there's a number yeah, that are yeah. out there, um, some, you know, much more visible than others. Um, you know, there's a there's a advisory circuit that's out there. You know, one of the big things I learned, actually, is that, you know, and, and this came about really a number of ways, but um, there are different flavors of NEDs and there are different flavors of support that people can get. Um, you know, I'm around growth and innovation. I love that stuff. And I'm also really, I really enjoy that um, backboard mentorship type of relationship. Um, I've had it for me. I want to pass that on. It's something that I enjoy doing. Um, I get really, I'm passionate about what we do as, a, as an industry. And so people feel that. But at the same time, you know, I've got some experience and maturity around things I've seen and done and therefore, you know, feel like I can pass that stuff on. It's part and parcel of my business, but I do some of that stuff for free anyway. Yeah. I always welcome, um, you know, people's interests. If it's not something I can help with, I'm well connected. I can well, connect people, people to yeah. somebody else. Um, so, you know, and I do that pretty regularly. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a tough job owning your own business no matter what business it is, it's a very condensed market. I'm also thinking about the, the people that, do you know what? You might be in a business now thinking you would start your own, but you're almost like, I don't know if that's really me. Like, I know a couple of people, I won't name them, that 
probably should have started their own business a few years ago, but they, there's a reason why they've not done it. And I don't think they're, they're probably more the number two. They're probably the guy that, and they might be better off just becoming the number two in the company they are or finding a company where they could be that number two. So again, if you're that person, you'd be hoping to have a chat with these yeah, guys. Yeah, happy to help. do that. Yeah. And you know, fundamentally, um, you know, I've made a, I made a good career out of being a number two risk averse number two like that's the the mindset i had um when i removed the risk bone yeah through the work i did at np and and you know you know had the benefit of of the financial side on on the mbo you know immediately i was like well actually what that was the thing that was stopping me right and and actually i can also talk about how you can spread your wings a bit mm. post so it's a little bit more about understanding what is the risk yeah. That you, and you can you also back. you can get a lot of reward and financial gain from being part of a sale or an exit rather 100%. than having to create the business. But it's a massively underrated, I would say it, right? But it's a massively underrated role because when you look at it, um, and again, as I said earlier on, a majority, if you look at the majority of successful businesses, specialist ones particularly, you know, that have done well over the last 10 years, there's always someone in that business who's the executioner or the number two that is, you know, seen as the one that brings you know, sense the stuff and gets things done. And it's a it's a really, really important job. CEOs love that person. You know, they love to have somebody that's alongside them that can help them. You know, my remit today, more of an operating partner as an advisor, you know, that's my style. But there's an absolute line of career for people that can convert those, um, you know, those relationships with the leader into something that enables the business and so absolutely yeah bring people on i'm more than happy to talk to people about how you can make that your career how important it is as well and you know ultimately what i always felt like i was hindered by was this risk bone but in actual fact it was the biggest and most important thing for me in my career you know to to be in a situation where i recognized that this the analogy i use and without killing more of your time but you know i can listen to a joke and I can tell what the joke punchline is going to be before it comes, right? But I can't tell jokes for toffee. And it's the same thing to a certain extent in the business piece. I can, I can get a strategy. I can get the vision. I can even develop it somewhat. And I, but I can ground it. And that's a skill set, a real yeah. skill set to understand how to do that. So, um, yeah, business leaders who need that type of help. Um, you know, or people who are good at doing that but don't quite understand how to yeah, yeah. play that. Come chat. You know, more right. happy to Wicked. chat. Well, look, David, thanks so much for taking the time out, mate. And uh, I'm I'm going to keep a keen eye on what you're up to at Saltwater as well. Um, and I really do hope people reach out and, and make the effort. So, um, guys, that's another episode of the Rag Podcast. I hope you're enjoying the show. Um, season two is is right in the mix and now as we as we push through 2020 um, there's a couple of things I want you guys to do as I always ask get yourselves on LinkedIn and share your thoughts of, of this episode and previous episodes um, to make sure we're getting more and more recruitment owners and recruiters listening to the show we are reaching some impressive numbers on a monthly basis and we only want it to go one way also when you're on the Apple podcast store please do give us your five star ratings and your comments to make sure that the guys up in the uh, in the Steve Jobs lab push us further and we get more reach. Um, I'll be back again next Wednesday with another recruitment owner and their unique story of growth. Speak to you then.